Brethren, we're uh, grateful for, to see you, those who are here for visiting with us, friends and family of our brother Brahim. We welcome you in Christ's name. And uh, you know, it's a special day for us as we will be witnessing an ordination at the end of our service. Uh, so what we'd ask is some of the brethren are going to be joining us from Kearney later around one o'clock. So if you all in the back, two or three pews, please move forward. Leave those pews uh, for those brethren who will be joining us. So Ayush and Dad, if you could just move forward too, that would be great. Uh, just find another spot, that would be wonderful. So there will be less disturbance when they come. Our call to worship this morning is uh, found in John chapter 10. John chapter 10, I'll be reading verses 9 to verse 15. 9 to 15. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Amen. Let's ask the Lord's help. O oh, Heavenly Father, we thank and bless and magnify your name because we were a one time a wandering sheep. We were a straying sheep. And in your goodness, your mercy, your kindness, you sent us a good shepherd our blessed Lord Jesus, who came, Lord, left heaven, came looking for us wandering sheep, and drew us, Lord, drew us with cords of love, saved us by his precious blood, Lord, redeemed us, and brought us back to God. We praise you, we magnify you, Lord Jesus, you are our shepherd, and therefore we have no want. Lord, you lead us, you feed us, you keep us, Lord, you watch out for us, you defend us, and you'll bring us to glory. We thank and bless your name, Lord, that week by week you come and minister to us from your abundance, from your goodness, Lord. You feed us rich food, rich food, Lord. Thank you for nourishing our souls, Lord. This week past, you were with us, and you continue to be with us, Lord. And we thank you for your promise, I will never leave you or forsake you. We thank you, Lord, that you raise up, Lord, under shepherds to feed your flock. Thank you for your goodness and mercy to our congregation, Lord, that we never go away hungry, that we come, Lord, longing and desiring and thirsty and hungry, and we come and we go away, Lord, having been satisfied, because you meet with us weekly, Lord, to nourish our souls and to feed us from your abundance, and so we look to you again, our Lord Jesus, as hungry sheep, as thirsty sheep, longing to be fed by the Master, by the Savior, by the Good Shepherd of our souls. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would minister to the hurting. You would minister, Lord, to those who are weeping and in, in, in time of mourning, that you would give them comfort. Lord, that you would speak to the hearts of uh, those who may be going through distress at this time, Lord, you would quiet their spirits and give them your peace, Lord. Speak peace and comfort to your people today. And to those who don't know you, Father, today would be the day that they would hear the voice of the Good Shepherd and follow him. By your grace and mercy, speak to us through your servant, Pastor Joe, who will be, Lord, uh, speaking on this very subject, this very topic, Lord, of shepherds that you have gifted and the uh, the responsibility of the sheep towards the shepherd. Give us 
Lord, listening ears. Help us to be sheep that hear the voice of the shepherd today. Help us, Lord, to hear and to do. Let us not be idle here as we pray. Speak to us, Lord, through your word, through song, Lord, as the brethren lead us in song. Father, we thank you for them week by week, Lord, leading us. Father, serving you and serving your people. The brethren in the AV upstairs, Lord, who are uh, audiovisual and the so many hands that are preparing the, uh, the Lord's table for us, Father. Just so many people who are doing the bulletins and handing out the bulletins and just so many things that go on, Lord, week by week. And we know that not one of those things is forgotten by you. And we thank you, Father, that every single work and service done in your name will receive its reward in time. We thank you, Lord Jesus. You are not, Lord... Uh, uh, one who would forget. Uh, Lord, thank you that a cup of cold water given in your name will be remembered on that day. We bless your name and thank you. Thank you for the blessing, Lord, of drawing near and worshiping you, the King of kings, Lord of lords, and one who is coming back in glory to take us to himself. Oh, Lord, lift our eyes towards heaven, lift our hearts towards heaven, and may you receive glory and honor and praise through your people today. We pray this in the name of our blessed Lord Jesus. Amen. Our first hymn today is uh, He Leadeth Me. It's hymn number 690, and Tress will be on the screen. Afternoon, church. Ooh, is that a little loud? I'm well good? Okay. Let's stand and sing, He Leadeth Me.
please remain standing uh, in our scripture reading. Please turn to Psalm 31. You can find that on page 404 in the Black Pew Bible in the back of the Bible. <coughs> Title of Psalm 31, To the Choir Master, a Psalm of David. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net that they have hidden for me. For you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love, because you, you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul, and you have not delivered me into the hand of my enemy." You have set my feet in a broad place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach especially to my neighbors, and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. Mm. I have become like a broken vessel, for I hear the whispering of many, terror on every side, as they scheme together against me as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord, I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. O Lord, let me not be put to shame, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them go silently to Sheol. Let the lying lips be mute, which speak insolently against the righteous in pride and contempt. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, and work, worked for those who take refuge in you, in the sight of the children of mankind. In the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in a besieged city. I have said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight, but you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. And there goes a reading of God's word. I'm going to sing now, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Six verses in this song, so on the screen if you're reading from your hymn, though you'll only see three.
share each other's woes Our mutual burdens bear And often for each other flows The sympathizing tear When we asunder inward pain but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again this glorious hope revives our courage by the It's nice to do that song when someone's not leaving. I've so connected that song to someone moving out of the area, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. Good to see everyone like close up, not to like look all around the back. The Lord is good, amen? amen? And the Lord is and has been good to our church. Uh, we have the blessing this afternoon of following an age old tradition that is established for us in the New Testament, practiced by God's people for 2,000 years. And that is the laying on of hands of an elder, as prescribed in the scripture. The leadership of God's people is something, is a matter that has changed over time. For millennia before Christ, God's people were led by a single human being. We can go back to Moses and see him as God's man who led his people out of Egypt. We can think of the days of the judges or of the kings, starting with, with, uh, with David, really, the, the king that was after God's heart, and then his sons and the posterity who served as kings over Israel. The people of God were clearly a monarchy at one time. But even David only pointed to a future. David was, a, of course, a shepherd king, and he pointed to the final and only shepherd king, the Lord Jesus Christ. So today, after Christ, we as God's people are no longer under the authority of a single individual person. Jesus has become our king, and he is our shepherd. We heard it in the call to worship in John chapter 10. He is the good shepherd, and he shepherds his one flock. Today, in this gospel age that we are in now, we live in a very unique time in the history of the world. We live between the comings of Christ, between his, his death and resurrection and his second coming. And in our age, the New Testament prescribes there to be human spiritual leaders who are appointed to lead and to feed the church. And so the Bible speaks to us in the New Testament of shepherds or pastors or elders or overseers. The, the word is used interchangeably in the New Testament. So when you see pastor or elder or overseer, you're seeing basically the same, different aspects of the very same office. 
and I will use them interchangeably today. I'll talk about elders, I'm speaking about pastors. When I'm talking about pastors, I'm talking about shepherds or overseers, using the word interchangeably. And specifically, it talks about a plurality that is plural, men, people of God who oversee the flock. Yes, human beings, but more than one who are called by God to keep order and lead and, f and feed the church. One day, brothers and sisters, one day the, assemblies, uh, the assembly of God before the throne will have no distinctions. There will be no need for human leadership anymore. One day when sin is removed, our congregation will again be a pure monarchy, a perfect monarchy. And we will worship under the leadership of God himself. But today, in our age, where the gospel has already saved people out of the world, but not yet removed sin completely from the world, we need a... We need human leaders, lest there be anarchy in the church. God, in his grace, grants to his church the gift of leaders under shepherds in submission to the chief shepherd. In his word, God gives explicit instructions as to how the church are to identify these men from among their midst. Who is it that qualifies for this office? One cannot read the New Testament and come away with the idea that either one, that the church ought to be under the charge of a single person, one person, any individual alone, or that the church should be without any human leadership at all. And yet we see both in uh, the church, the modern church today. Instead, we see in the scripture elders, plural, Elders, plural, over each church, not ruling as tyrants did in the Old Testament. Moses and Israel are no longer the model of leadership in the New Testament, since Christ, our Moses, has already come. But now elders, plural, elders lead and guide God's people as shepherds, and their leadership is necessary. It is true authority has and continues to be abused. Whether we see it early on in the church by popes, and I'll use that pope with a capital P, referring to the, the pope of the Catholic Church, but there are many popish men who autocratically rule their local congregations, and they're like local popes. <laughs> men have ruled over, over congregations without accountability fleecing the flock for their own personal gain. This goes on. There's the abuse of power, the abuse of authority for sinful and selfish reasons. And as a result of that, many Christians say, we don't need authority, and they flee from the church. And they, their expressions of worship are, are, are quite different. They adopt perhaps an overrealized eschatological idea that says that Christ is king, and as long as I have Christ as my king and I have my Bible, I have everything I need. I don't need the church. I don't need to congregate. I don't need leadership over my soul. In addition, this goes hand in hand with the culture. We live in an anti-authority culture. Our, our days are not unlike the days of judges, where every man seeks to be his own authority. Social media is evidence of that. Everyone loves his own authority and loves their social media page because they rule it. Personal sovereignty is perhaps the most prolific idol of our culture. Personal sovereignty. And sadly, some of God's people have been badly affected by this idol. And they choose to do what is right in their own eyes rather than follow the means that God lays out for us in Scripture. Our text for today that we're going to look at in Hebrews chapter 13 happens to fall today on the day we're going to be receiving our brother as, uh, as our elder and ordaining him. Um, it's a command to God's people. It's an act of worship. And it calls us to do something that many in this world disdain, gnash their teeth at. It calls us to follow the leader, or better, follow the leaders. It calls us, in particular, to hated ideas. 
It calls us to obey and to submit. How the world hates those concepts. But as Christians, these are two concepts, obedience and submission, are, that are gems to us. There are, there are protection. We can rest in these. And if you don't love those concepts of obedience and submission, then you need to have your mind renewed because your mind is being squeezed into the mold of this world. Let's read our text, Hebrews chapter 13, verse, I'll just read verse 17, but we'll look at verse 17 and 18 today. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us ears to hear what you, what you would say to your church, Lord. I pray that your word would not return void, but would accomplish all that you have set it forth to accomplish today in our midst. I pray that you would be magnified and glorified, even as we are talking about a matter that is, uh, deals with human beings in the church. I pray that Jesus Christ would be magnified and exalted in this word as he is our good shepherd. We ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Give you a little context. Uh, beginning at the end of chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews takes up this matter of acceptable worship. And he tells us what acceptable worship is. What, how do you worship God acceptably in light of the fact of all that Christ has done, in light of the fact that uh, his excellency and his superiority, and, and he's taken you and put you in a, an unshakable kingdom. In light of this, in light of this, how do we worship acceptably? There are no... Uh, chapter breaks in the, um, in, the, in the Bible. The chapter breaks were added by men. So what happens is once you cross over to chapter 13, uh, he gives us the answer. So the question, how do you worship God acceptably, is answered in chapter 13. In chapter 13, it tells us how. How do we acceptably worship Jesus Christ? How do we worship him with our lives? How do we live out our lives in Christ? And we saw last time that acceptable worship includes the fruit of our lips. That is the offering of praise, the sacrifice of praise, and thanksgiving where we confess the name of Jesus. But then true worship also is in what we do. True worship also consists of practically loving one another. Verse 1 of chapter 13. Showing hospitality. Verse 2. Remembering those who are in prison, verse 3. Honoring fidelity in marriage, verse 4. Living sacrificially, verses 5 and 6. Honoring and being in submission to sound spiritual leadership, verses 7 and 17. I'm just going to stop here because I was a little disturbed. Uh, let's just let anyone who comes in take the seats in the back from this point forward. This way we don't have any more. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. So look at verse 7. Remind, let's be reminded of verse 7. Look back. We're commanded in verse 7, a threefold command. We did this many weeks ago, but remind you of the threefold command. Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Remember your leaders, consider the outcome of their life and imitate their faith. Now, this idea remains in the minds, uh, the mind of the author, all the way up to verse 17, which we're in today. Now, if you look at verse 17, you'll see that he's picking up on the same idea of leadership, remembering your leaders. And in verse 17, he gives us twofold imperative or command, and that is to obey and to submit. Acceptable worship for the people of God involves obeying and submitting to the leadership of the church. Now, how do we understand this? Because 
um, uh, certainly of all of the commands of scripture, obedience and submission have been misunderstood and misapplied, uh, both in the church and in marriage and a lot of different situations. How are we to understand this twofold command? First, the word obey is the Greek word pethaste, taken from the Greek patho. Uh, patho is used more widely in the New Testament to speak of persuasion, have be pers being persuaded, or having confidence in something. The author does not use the typical Greek word for obedience here, and that's important that we understand that. He could have, and he didn't. And he wants to make sure here that the point is that the obedience that we have to leadership in the church is not blind and it's not merely outward. There's a persuasion of the mind of the church um, uh, that, that, that's carried by the pastor, in particular the pastor's teaching. This is in the passive voice here. So this is, in a sense, this is something that's kind of happening to you as you hear the word preached. The author is commanding God's people not so much to actively obey, but to be persuaded by their pastors. That is, to gain confidence in their pastors. Gain confidence in their doctrine, in their teaching, and in their life. In this particular case, the NIV is the only Bible version that I know of that I think captures this idea. Verse 17 in the NIV says this, Have confidence in your leaders. It's not a blind obedience of a merely outward act, merely going through the action of, of obeying, but rather it's a, it's a heart. It's a spirit of submission. It's less about servile subjection and more about respect. How do you come to this place? How do you come to the place of trusting, having, gaining confidence? How do you gain confidence in your elders? Well, you do as you listen, as you listen to how the pastor accurately exposits the scripture, making appropriate application derived from the text of scripture. And when you, when you find an application that's not in the scripture and you ask the pastor, where did you get that? And he said, well, we needed to hear it. It didn't come from the text, but we needed to hear it. No. Is the application being derived from the text? And as you find such a man who understands and applies the word of God regularly, week in and week out, you start to develop trust for that person. You grow in your confidence for that person. You are persuaded. Here is a man who rightly divides the word of truth. You prove to your own heart, in a sense. Here is a man who is able to teach. We had to do that a number of weeks ago when we were examining our, our brother Brahim for eldership. Is he a man that is able to teach? And we, as a congregation, were persuaded that indeed he is. Paul wrote to Titus, he is able to give instruction, talking about the elder, he is able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. As you find such a man, as you find one who is not greedy, not a lover of money, not so, uh, or um, uh, not a lover of money, but sober-minded, uh, self-controlled, respectable, not quarrelsome, uh, self-controlled, holding firm to the word of God. And when such a man is, te is tested and proven dependable, then, brethren, it's the most natural thing in the world to trust that person. Right? And that's where obedience is linked to trust. It's not just outwardly going through the mo Well, I obeyed. Technically, I obeyed. No, it's a heart of trust. When a, when a church obeys its leaders, it's saying, we trust this man to lead us in the gospel. He's not going to be influenced by the strange teachings that are out there. That's what it means to trust your pastor, in particular his teaching. If you feel your pastor is teaching another gospel, then it is best for you to find another pastor who you can trust. However, when you do find pastors who you can be confident in, as much as in human flesh, of course, only, only the reality of that, that these are sinful men, pastors are sinful men, but when you can find one that you're confident in, follow them as they follow Christ. 
and submit to their authority. Which brings us to the second command in verse 17. The first verb, patho, is a passive, in a passive imperative. The second is a stronger word. It's hupeko, sorry, hupeko, um, in the active voice. And it basically means be submissive, give way, yield, heed his voice. Heed his voice over other voices. Look, we live in an age where there are so many voices that are clamoring for our attention, right? One of the greatest challenges, I can tell you, we, we often in our elders' meetings talk about this. One of the greatest challenges for, for pastors in our day is competing with the voices that individuals, members of our church, listen to during the week. We, as your elders, be, have become like that proverbial parent with their kid in public school. We get you one hour a week, and they get you all the rest of the time. You go out and you're influenced, you come and you hear the word of God, and then you go out and you're influenced by your favorite preacher, or your favorite blogger, or the internet ministry that you love, or your favorite political pundit, and you expose yourself to their voices, even voices that might differ from your pastors. And listen, I'm not suggesting that you never expose yourself to the wealth of good teaching that is available in our day and age. We're, we're thankful for that. But I am saying, when you have trusted elders who have proven themselves, trust them. Trust them. Look, we're not going to get 100%. And, and we may be wrong. And we will be wrong at times. But give the due weight of your elders' teaching and your elders' counsel when you've come to the place of trusting them. And I'm not suggesting blind submission here. Nowhere does the scripture instruct blind submission anywhere. Whether it's subjection to the governing authorities in Romans 13 or wives' submission to their husbands in Ephesians 5, every exhortation to submission is qualified by other exhortations. And you are no more required to submit to an elder who is teaching falsely than you are, than the people of God were, to submit to Nebuchadnezzar's edict to worship an image of himself or to, for a wife to submit to an ungodly husband who requires his wife to do something that is against her conscience. There is no such requirement. The submission spoken of here is not absolute. Listen to the words of Calvin as he's writing on this text. Uh, he writes, the author commands first obedience and then honor to be rendered to them. These two things are necessarily required so that the people might have confidence in their pastors. But it ought at the same time to be noticed that the apostle speaks only of those who faithfully performed their office. For they have nothing but a title, nay, who use the title of pastor for the purpose of destroying the church, deserve but little reverence and less confidence. And this also is what the apostle plainly sets forth when he says, they watched over your souls, a duty that is not performed, but by those who are faithful rulers and are really what they are called. And I think he gets that right. Our submission is not blind. Brethren, you are never exhorted to submit to leaders who deviate from the gospel. We've already dealt with this back in verse 9. We saw that. He said, flee from those who are influenced by the strange teaching. Avoid them. Our attitude ought never be, I believe this because my pastor told me. My pastor said so. And then we're back in Rome. Then, then, we're back, then we're trusting an infallible pope. But rather, what this is a call to is to remember and honor and obey and submit only to the authority of those faithful leaders of your local church who uphold the true gospel. And that is true of the brethren here, as well as those visiting, in, if you're a part of a church. If they are holding to the true gospel, then remember, honor, obey, and submit. And you can't ignore these commands. 
Because this is what acceptable worship is to God. This is a view that is challenged like no other ideology in our day. In this world that's consumed with self-autonomy and self-reliance, a world that rejects authority, speaks evil of dignitaries, a world where children rise up in pride against their parents and against their elders, a world where almost everyone considers themselves an expert on everything and they are qualified to judge. They're qualified to tell leaders, whether it be civil leaders in the government or church leaders in the church, how they ought to, to rule and what they ought to do. And this is a prevailing sin in the world. And that spirit is in the church as well. The idea that many Christians live by. I have Christ. I have my Bible. That's all I need. Ironically, ignores the, the very command of Scripture to assemble together. God commands you to assemble together. You say, all I need is Christ in my Bible. And I know I'm a Christian. Well, you're, you're, you're going against the Bible. You say that you need. Makes no sense, right? To ignore the commands of Scripture is sinful. And here we have two commands, to obey and submit. And to not do so is to rebel. To rebel against not only the authority in your church, but Christ himself who appointed that man to that office. But you object. You say, wait a minute, you're bringing me back to the Old Testament, Pastor. Things changed at Pentecost. Every believer, we're all kings and priests now. Are you bringing us back to a monarchy? Listen, submission to authority is found throughout the New Testament. In the early church, with all of the contributions made by the members of the church, there was still calls to honor and submit to leadership. Let me show you one, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And there are many, many that we could look at. But let me show you one, 1 Thessalonians 5. First Thessalonians 5, Paul writes in verses 12 and 13. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. Another Example, along with Hebrews chapter 13. It is true, I will concede, and it is true that God gives considerable authority to the church, meaning the local congregation. We see this in the New Testament. The church, for example, determines whether a sinning member among their midst is to be disciplined. That's not the leaders. No pastor has a right to simply write a letter to someone and say, don't come here anymore. He is not given that authority, but the church has the authority to remove someone from their midst. No priest can bind and loose a person's sins in a confessional booth. It's the church as a whole in Matthew 18 that are given this authority from God as to whether or not to bind or loose a person because of their sins. True, at Pentecost, God anointed every believer in the entire church with the indwelling presence and power of the Holy Spirit. He did not limit that to leaders, but gave it to all of his people. It was also to the church that God gave a variety of gifts. And the purpose of those gifts is to minister to one another. Ministers are not the man who stands up, or not the man who gets paid, or not the man on the front of your bulletin. We are all ministers. Ministers in the New Testament are not a separate class of clergy. They are in the body of Christ. We minister to one another. We are all called and we are all equipped, if you are in Christ, to minister to one another. It's the church as a whole. It's a church as a whole that's been empowered by the Spirit, given the authority to go into the world and preach the gospel. That's not just pastors. That's all believers. 
And we know that throughout the ages, first the Roman Catholic Church, but then there were many other expressions of Christendom as well, have usurped the authority of the church, meaning the people, and placed it into the hands of a few clergy class. And the scripture does teach of the priesthood of every believer. There is no unique priest. Every believer is a priest. We are a kingdom of priests. We believe in that, the priesthood of every believer. We believe in congregationalism. We believe that that's the model of the New Testament. We're moving away from, we're changing from that Old Testament pattern of the Moses model and the Levite model in the Old Testament. And now in Christ, we are all priests. And that priesthood is handed to every believer. However, however, all of that being true, it does not negate the need for sound leaders in the church. We've been studying it recently, right? In, in, um, over the last couple of months, examining our brother for the qualifications of eldership. It's very specific how the New Testament describes the man who would be an elder. We find considerable teaching in much of the New Testament explaining very clearly how do you identify the men that are called to lead. Elders or, or pastors were appointed all the way back in the early church in, in the book of Acts. Paul ordered apostolic agents to appoint elders in every church. That's the assumed model of the New Testament. That there is a church body under the leadership of a plurality of elders. So you ask, is the church a monarchy? Well, it is. Christ is our king, not the elder, not Moses, not God's man, but Christ. We don't go back to the Old Testament model for our standard of church leadership, no. But it is a monarchy in that we submit to Christ. Is the church a democracy? Well, if you mean by that, that the whole body mutually minister to one another, then yes, the church is a democracy in that way. Is the church a hierarchy? Yes, in that Christ appoints specifically chosen men to exercise a delegated authority in leading and feeding the flock. So it's all of those things. It is a monarchy. It is a democracy. It is a hierarchy, depending on how you look at it. This is the biblical model. A true pastor does not act like the civil leaders who dominate by coercion and force. He is a servant leader, and the servant of God is not quarrelsome. He does not force submission. He's a man who is crucified with Christ, and he leads in human weakness by the power of the Spirit. And to such men, God would say in 1 Peter 5, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Such a man you can have confidence in. A leader in the church can only lead others as much as he is relying upon the grace of God. Christ alone is the one chief shepherd, right? He's the good shepherd. Those who he calls to the pastorate are men, but we are only qualified as much as we are like Christ. Of the Good Shepherd, listen to these beautiful words written by the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2. Of the Good Shepherd, he writes these words, Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in the appearance as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's who we follow, brothers and sisters. That's who all of us follow. That is the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. That's where our hope lies, not, not in obedience, but in Christ's perfect obedience, 
So you could say, I've been sinful. I've missed the mark. I, I haven't submitted to my elders. I, I, I've not even been part of a church. Well, the good news is you're not going to earn your salvation by suddenly becoming obedient. But your trust in the one whose perfect obedience, even unto death on a cross, in your place, dying in your place. And this is the model that is provided for us for an elder. He perfectly fulfills it. We fall short. When it comes to submission and obedience, we are bent for rebellion on, on our own, in our flesh. We are bent to rebel. Every one of us are bent to rebel. But Jesus perfectly submitted to the Father, even to death on a cross. And he did it in our place to pay the penalty for our rebellion. So if you would examine yourself and say, yes, I admit, I see the rebellion in my heart. I would ask you to trust a great Savior today who perfectly obeyed the Father. Today, if you will but believe on him who carried your sin upon himself on the cross, you will find your sin fully paid for. God's justice fully satisfied. That is the glorious good news that we preach every week, calling sinners to repentance, but also reminding us as Christians that that yes, there will be times we get convicted of our sin, but there is one who is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And if you find in your heart remaining rebellion, then if you confess that sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive you. As wonderful as that news is, I can't, I can't go on, I have to stop here. And, and just tell you that the gospel doesn't end with the incarnation and death of Christ. The good news continues in Philippians chapter 2. In verse 9 it says, Therefore, because he was obedient unto death, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So Jesus was obedient to death on the cross, but he didn't remain dead. He is the risen shepherd that we'll look at next time. But just as a preview, look down to verse 20. Of this Jesus Christ, it says in verse 20 of Hebrews 13, it says, He brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. Christ died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come. Again, hallelujah. You can trust him today. Do not harden your heart. Repent and believe this good news. Back to our text. The author goes on. We're in the middle of verse 17 of uh, chapter 13. The author gives four reasons why you can trust your leaders, why you can submit to them. The four reasons are listed in your outline. First, they, will give a, they watch over your soul. Second, they will give an account. Third, your submission makes their leadership a joy. And fourth, to do otherwise is to no advantage to you. Look, look, in the, look at verse 17 again. It says, for they, this is where the, we get these four points from verse 17. For they are keeping watch over your soul as those who will give an account, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So the reason for the church's trust and submission lies in the special responsibility that leaders have to watch over your soul. What does that mean? Watch over. Well, literally, it means to sleep, lose sleep. Lose sleep watching over watching over the spiritual lives of the church. Pastors are constantly thinking of ways to support and sustain the spiritual life and growth of the church. Pastors are occupied with your well-being, if you're in a good church. Pastors are occupied with your well-being, not in growing their numbers, but in your well-being. And at times, they lie awake at night worrying about you. Yes, we do. 
Fathers here, let me ask you, how, how, how many times have you lost sleep worrying about your child? Well, well, we do. Pastors lie awake at night worrying about you. We, we read books. We attend meetings to be better shepherds. What better reason is there to submit and follow your leaders than to know that? Let me give you an illustration. Those of you who are wives here, you, you will know this immediately. You know, as a wife, how difficult it is to submit to your own husband when you believe he's making a selfish, selfish decision for your family, right? I, I know this because your husbands are sinners. <laughs> and we do not always act selflessly. And the reality is men are selfish. So you know you know that. It's hard to submit when you think your husband is acting selfishly. But I hope also you will know the rest and the confidence of trusting your husband's leadership when you know he is acting out of selfless love. I hope you know that. That's the idea that's being conveyed here. If your pastor is treating you like a slave, it's hard to submit, nor should you. But when you know, when you have that confidence that he's talking about, the confidence that your elders are, have your best interest in mind, it's the most natural thing to follow their lead. Follow their lead whether it be their decisions, the policies, ministry involvement in our preaching, in our counsel. If we establish ministries in the church, it's to help you. If we have a retreat or a life group or, or prayer meetings or youth groups or, or classes, that's for you. That's for your family. That is not for our health. It's for yours. And... and and brethren, you do a disservice by ignoring that, by deciding for yourself not to heed their advice, not to attend to the ministries that are offered to you. If, if we recommend that you attend a life group during the week, what are we getting from that? Right? All right I, I, I'm serious, think about it. We recommend you go to a home group during the week, or during the month. Try to make two. Say, I'm really busy, I can only do one, all right? But what, do we, what do we gain from that? We gain nothing. If we set up a youth retreat, it's for your children. If we have a ladies' conference, that is for you, ladies. What do we gain? These things are a lot of work for pastors. But we do this for you. It's our work to equip you to strengthen the hope that anchors your soul to heaven. And that's why these ministries are in place. You say, ah, but I know better. The elder must be watchful. He can be trusted based upon his accepting the responsibility for the shepherding of the souls of those that are in his care. And that's what it says, secondly, as those who will give an account. As those who will give an account. The, the, Construction of the Greek sentence is a bit different, a little more nuanced than it is in English. The way it's stated in English, it almost seems like this is a frightening obligation. That you're going to give an account before God for the way. But, but, but more, Peter O'Brien brings this out in his commentary. When he talks about giving an account, uh, less about necessity and obligation, but more about the voluntary dimension that's in view here. Pastors watch over the flock willingly. And you see that in 1 Peter 5 as well. Willingly, gladly. We gladly take this responsibility. We're, we're happy for the added responsibility of the flock's health. Our attitude as elders is as the apostle who wrote, I will gladly spend and be spent for you. Your elders will give an account for our stewardship of your soul. And that both means now, today, as the members of this church, your elders are praying for you, uh, ordering the life of the church to, as we see best for your spiritual benefit. And it also means that we're going to give a full and final account on Judgment Day. This is why 1 Timothy 4.16 exhorts us to lead and keep a close watch on ourselves and our teaching. 
He says, persist in this, and by so doing, you will, both, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So brethren, considering the responsibility that your elders bear before you and before God as watchmen over your soul, is there any greater motive for you than your confidence, your trust, and your submission? The tedious work of shepherding is then made joyful as the atmosphere of the church is one of trust and submission. It is a heavy uh, responsibility, yes, but that heaviness does not mean that it is not joyful. It, it is a joy to watch over souls that are given to our account. When, when a pastor sees a member of his flock, one who is given to his care, growing, changing, being conformed to the image of Christ, we have no greater joy. Again, I say, fathers, when you see spiritual fruit in your children, is there any greater joy? In contrast, leaders groan under the heavy burden of a lack of trust. Any pastor will tell you that what wears him down most is not his labors on your behalf, not his ministry, not the hard work of studying and preparing sermons, not the time given for discipling or counseling, but the frustration that comes with those who are hard-hearted and stubbornly buck against their leadership. That's what wears a pastor out. I can attest to this. I can attest to the drain that the elders felt during the time when we went through that seemingly endless season of church discipline a couple of years ago and the public rebellion that followed that. People whose souls we were given to, to give an account for were scattered. One member of our church handed over to Satan. And it's that kind of hard-hearted disobedience that causes elders to groan. A.W. Pink correctly assesses our feelings when he writes this. He says, nothing is more disheartening and saddening to a pastor and to meet with opposition from those whose highest interests he is serving with all of his might. I picked on uh, selfish husbands earlier. Let me illustrate this by looking at disrespectful wives because we also know that that goes on, right? Ladies, there's nothing more disheartening to your husband than when you fight and disrespect him when he knows that he is serving your best interest. Now, he may be wrong, but when he is convinced that he is doing this for you and you spurn that, you grieve him. And it is the same for elders. We're not going to be right all the time. Sometimes we're going to be wrong, not willfully. Now we're going to willfully make a wrong decision. But we will always have, by God's grace, the earnest desire for your spiritual health, the good of the flock. You may disagree with our decision, and that's your prerogative. You can disagree. Godly elders will always allow opportunities to respectfully appeal decisions. We know that we are imperfect men. But what is not acceptable is grieving your elders with strife. Striving brings us grief, brethren. And ironically, the scripture tells us that when you strive against your authorities, you end up despising your own mercies. Verse 17 closes here. That would be unprofitable for you, he says. Meaning the grief that you bring to your authorities is unprofitable for you. It brings a leanness to your soul. Lack of trust will only keep you from receiving their instruction and their counsel it will end up quenching your own zeal and your own vigor. You, why? Because you cannot offer God acceptable worship and disobey his commands. If you cannot have respect for and submit to the elders of your church, men who have proven themselves to watch out for your souls as those who will give an account, you will instead become a source of grief to them rather than joy. And we can't think that the Lord will favor us and be in, in rebellion to our leadership. He is displeased by rebellion. We see this throughout the scripture. 
The Lord supports and upholds the authorities He delegates, and He is displeased, and He, and he withdraws His tokens of grace to those who dishonor His messengers. And maybe, just maybe, maybe, if this hits home for someone, maybe the lukewarmness that you're feeling, maybe the lack of zeal that you once had, maybe the coldness that you feel in your heart toward Christ, or, or the waning of love that you have for the people of God that you're experiencing is because you have not followed your pastor's lead and decided for yourself what you believe is best for you or your family. And that's not a threat. That's, I'm not trying to coerce obedience here. It's right out of verse 17. It says, that would, for that would be unprofitable for you. Lack of submission to leaders is detrimental to your spiritual health and the health of the congregation. So when you have significant differences from your elders so that you can no longer submit, it's better to go and find another sound church than to upset the unity of the body and the bond of peace. Brothers and sisters, there are few things in this world that are more beautiful than the body of Christ the bond of peace, the unity of the body, dwelling together in unity. God says he's pleased with this when, when we can dwell together in unity. That is acceptable worship. You will witness fewer, uh, few richer blessings in this life than belonging to a unified, godly, holy church that loves one another, that serves one another, where the sheep and the shepherd are dwelling together in harmony. There is no better thing in the world. That's, that's what we see illustrated in Psalm 23. The sheep are lying down in green pastures. They're drinking of the quiet waters. Why? Because they're well led and they're well fed. That's a foretaste of heaven. Hallelujah. I'll close very quickly just looking at verse 18 by way of application. Verse 18. The author's concern for leadership leads him to ask this in verse 18. He says, pray for us, for we're sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. As we consider the high calling and expectation of an elder, we all the more realize our need. Paul himself wrote of it. He said, who is sufficient for these things? It's no wonder then the author would say, pray for us. He says, we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. What he's saying, in essence, is in light of this authority, this duty, this responsibility that, that is upon the pastor, pray for us. We, we think, he's saying here, we think we're doing this right. We have a clear conscience. We think we're doing this right. We desire to act honorably. We know our desires is to act honorably in all things. We believe we're serving God. We believe we're staying faithful to the gospel. And we believe we're loving God's people. But nevertheless, we need your prayers. Brethren, pray for your elders. If you're here visiting from another church, pray for your pastors and elders. I am sure the enemy is attacking them in some way. Pray for those who might be your future elders. I'm sure the enemy is seeking to keep men from this noble calling in the future. Satan hates the fact that God gives gifts to his church. And he will fight tooth and nail to keep that from happening. So listen, brethren. The only reason you won't pray for your elders is you don't really understand the, the gravity of that office. The church's need for leadership. If you underestimate the temptations and attack that a pastor comes under and his family come under, you won't pray. But if you understand those things, you'll pray. We're living in a time that is marked like no other by the gross sins among church leaders. And maybe it always went on, but now with the advent of social media, we see it. And with that, the discouragement that comes in the ministry is at an all-time high. The damage that is caused by Christian leaders who are looked up to, who fall into sin, are inestimable. 
So we have to raise our voice in prayer to God that that would not happen to us. We need you to pray for us. Pray for the protection of your elders and leaders from spiritual attack, from the dangers, toils, and snares that come from living in this dark world. God has been good to us. He has seen fit to favor us today with another elder, Brahim, who we will ordain. He, as well as I, Pastors Eli, Pastor Damien, will not make it alone. Now, yes, we pledge to serve you with a clear conscience. We desire to act honorably in all things, but we will only do so, and we will only survive as much as you pray for us. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, I'm sorry, Brother Jay, I'm going to lead us in a prayer of confession before we partake of the Lord's Supper. Thank you, Lord, that you bless us with abundance of elders, Lord, that we look forward to the ones that are coming up, Lord. We thank you for all these things, Lord. Father, we have sinned times without number and been guilty of pride and unbelief, of failure to find thy mind in thy word, of neglect to seek thee in our daily life. Our transgressions and shortcomings present us with a list of accusations. Mm -hmm. But I bless thee, O Lord, mm -hmm. that they will not stand against us, for all have been laid on Christ. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Go on to do <coughs> our corruptions mm -hmm. and grant mm -hmm. us grace to live above them. Mm -hmm. Let not the passions of the flesh nor lustings of the mind mm -hmm. bring our spirits into subjection, mm -hmm. but do that rule over us in liberty and power. We thank you, Lord, that you are our advocate to the Father and hold no sin against us, Lord. Because of your righteousness, you grant us conviction that we may walk in Jesus' life to his voice, Lord. We thank you, Father, for this. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. In a moment, we're going to be partaking of the Lord's table together as his children. If you're visiting with us here today, you are welcome to join us at the table. If you are born again and you have been baptized and are part of a sound evangelical church, then please join us at the table. Uh, refrain from participating in the table if you've not been baptized, not part of a sound evangelical church, or if you are practicing any willful, unrepentant sin or have unresolved conflict with one another. Um, anytime, we could call, yeah, guys, I'm going to go right into this now. Yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll turn and we will take, sing the next two songs. After those songs, you'll come, or during those songs, you'll come forward, take the elements back to your seat, and we'll participate together as a body uh, after a brief um, devotional time. <clears throat> so let's stand now and sing yet not I but through Christ in me followed by how beautiful. And during that time, please come up and take the elements and we'll partake together. What a gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My 
My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing for oh, all. Mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, or by my side. The Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hope, my shepherd will defend me. has been won and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me no fate I dread I know I am forgiven the future is sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hope my sin has been defeated. to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hold my hope
Let's sing now, How Beautiful. with his body and blood and then he served us till the end we heard a lot about the under shepherds sobering encouraging uh, sermon but I want us to as we look into the Lord's table hmm. we're gonna refocus our eyes on the Lord a little bit Amen. 
we heard in this chapter that we heard our Lord is being called the, the great shepherd. Peter calls him the chief shepherd. And in John 10, a few verses I'm going to read for you, our Lord himself, he calls himself the good shepherd. And that's the one that brings comfort to our hearts, right, more than anything. Hmm. So let me share with you some verses from John 10, verse 10 and 11, and then 14 and 18. Our Lord says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will be one fold. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down mm. on my own accord. Our Lord is the good shepherd because he was willing to lay down his life for his sheep. Uh, why did he have to lay down his life for the sheep? Because we were sinners, right? We were under the judgment of God. Mm. In Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6, Isaiah says the following. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Mm. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's mm. why he had to lay down his life. <coughs> but I tell you, he also says, I laid it down according in, in my, on my own accord. He didn't have to lay it down. He could have created a whole new bunch of sheep for himself. But he didn't. He chose to lay his life down for us. Why? For two reasons. One, because that brought him joy. In Hebrews 12, 2, he says the following, who for the joy that was set before him, mm. he endured the cross, despising the shame. He chose to lay down his life because that brought him joy in saving us. Another reason we read in Isaiah, he says, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. So saving us brought him satisfaction and brought him joy. But there's another reason. He laid down his life for us because he loved us so Amen. much. In John 13, 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, hmm. he loved them to the end. He laid down his life for us because he loved us so much to the point that he was willing to lay down his life for you and for me. So as we come to the Lord's table, let us come to the great shepherd. Amen. Let us remember the chief shepherd. And most of all, let us remember the good shepherd who laid down his life for us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the joy of being in your house. As we have heard repeatedly this morning, there is not, not a time we come into your house and leave empty-handed. You satisfy our souls. You feed us. You provide for us. Most of all, we praise you and worship you this morning for our Lord Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for each and every one of us. Nobody forced him. Of his own accord, he chose to do so because he loved us and because that brought him joy to see us saved from our sins. We worship him, we praise him, we adore him, we kiss him, and may we live our life 
in service of him. Amen. Amen. Let us participate. close now with uh, Christ is mine forevermore. Found its 
treasure Christ is mine forevermore Christ is mine forevermore Christ is mine forevermore Amen Bow your heads for the closing benediction. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 You be seated. I'm going to do the announcements now, so that uh, we'll just go right into the ordination after. Just a few announcements. Uh, First of all, regarding this afternoon, regarding the fellowship downstairs. So pay attention to this, because you need to uh, follow this. Um, Right after the ordination, if you're a server, if you're one of the ones who are doing the serving of the food, you make your way right after the ordination, go straight downstairs. The rest of us... 15 minutes, stay up here, fellowship with with each other, uh, and 15 minutes, we'll make our way downstairs. Beginning with those of Brahim's guests, family, friends, uh, you would go first. We want you to make sure you get get down there first. Uh, So someone, maybe you can take the lead on that in in leading them downstairs. the head of the line, and then uh, the rest of us will follow after that. So give them about 15 minutes to get everything warmed up and set up, and then we'll make our way down. A few other announcements coming up. April is a busy month. It is uh, Passion Week coming up. Uh, April 2nd is Palm Sunday. Uh, There will be a craft for the children. There's also our regular prayer meeting, but there will be a craft for the children in celebration of Passion Week for ages 3 and up. You do need parents to respond to uh, the emails so that we make sure we have enough for uh, all of your children. Then the following Friday, Friday is Good Friday, April 7th, uh, we will be doing here a Passover Seder, uh, which is a remembrance of the uh, Last Supper that Jesus celebrated with his disciples, as we even heard in uh, John chapter 13, how he celebrated Passover with his disciples. A great opportunity to invite unbelievers or other believers who just want to want to be greatly blessed by this beautiful portrayal of Christ in the Passover. That's Friday night, Good Friday. That's a joint service with Calvary Gospel here. I believe we'll be doing it downstairs in the fellowship area. Invite um, you can invite students to your to to it as well. Um, you have the opportunity to invite students to your home for the holidays respond to that email. I think today might be the last day or tomorrow might be the last day. If you'd like to have uh, some college students to introduce them to the gospel, have them sit around your table for dinner, then bring them either Good Friday or on, uh, on, on uh, Resurrection Sunday. Uh, the week following that, April 22nd, 22nd right? Is 22nd the youth retreat? April 21st is the youth retreat. Uh, you can help by donating for that. Just indicate that, that it's for the youth retreat. Put it in the offering box. Uh, and if you have not yet signed up your kids, be sure to do that. You, there's a link online for that. And then the last week of the month of April, so we have something every weekend, April 29th is our ladies' conference at Christian Fellowship Church in East Brunswick. Time's running out to register for that, ladies, so make sure you do that at the link that you'll get. There's also a flyer. If you'd like to take one, they're out on the table. You can invite other ladies as well. And um, uh, certainly, the youth retreat, the ladies' conference is for both Wayne and Carney as well, uh, as well as where many other churches are going to be involved and in those as well. So keep those things in prayer. What we're going to do now, I'm going to call up Pastor Eli, who is going to give the charge for... Uh, for our brother, Brahim, and lead us uh, listening to him, and then we'll, we'll uh, pray for and ordain our brother into the ministry. Well, just about everything I was going to say, Pastor Joe already said, but nonetheless, um, In summary, we have the blessing today, as Pastor Joe already mentioned, and we greet you, brethren, Carney brethren, welcome. It's 
It's good to see the, your faces back again. Um, we'll be ordaining our pastor and brother, Rahim Hiro, as a gift of Christ to his church to shepherd Christ's flock here at Bread of Life Fellowship. Jesus, our good shepherd, loves us so much as we heard that he has raised up and equipped our brother to feed and care for us, his sheep. God has been good to us, brethren, to find a man that fits the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 with a godly character and committed to faithful handling of the word of God is a rare thing indeed nowadays. So we bless his name for that. But before our brother comes uh, for us to, as elders to lay our hands and pray for him, I want to give a charge to our brother. And brother, these are things, uh, uh, what I'm about to say are in summary form of what Pastor Joe already stated and are a refresher for you having served as a pastor at, at uh, Protestant Arabic Bible Church for so many years. The task that you are going to assume as one of uh, sh- uh, one of the shepherds in this congregation can be summarized in these three things. It is a noble task, it is a solemn task, and it is a rewarding task. It's a noble task. We read in 1 Timothy 3.1, the saying is trustworthy for if anyone aspires the office of an overseer, he desires a noble task. This task is noble, honorable, and beautiful. It is noble because there is no greater honor than to serve our King and Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. Some count it a privilege to serve their king and country. We get to serve the King of kings and righteous and his righteous eternal kingdom. In your profession as a podiatrist, you know what a blessing it is to be able to relieve people of pain and suffering so they can walk comfortably. In this profession of a a pastor, you get to help people with their spiritual struggles so they can walk in the joy of the Lord and deliver those who don't know the Lord from eternal suffering to eternal heaven and kingdom. Notice also it is called a task. It is not just uh, a, a mere title of honor, but it is work and toil, as we heard. You will be laboring in the word and doctrine and prayer. It requires hard work. Paul says to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.15, do, uh, do your best or be diligent to, be pres- uh, to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has not, no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. The word worker is in reference to a field worker. A laborer working hard in the field, in the, in the open sun, open weather. He, it's, it's hard work. It's toil. Uh, you know how difficult it is times to understand the meaning of the text in order to be able to properly expound it and apply it. And as you know, dealing with some people, as we heard, can be challenging. Uh, they will try your patience. Some will give you grief instead of joy. Well, you will need the grace of patience and long-suffering. Always remember that God has called you to, into this ministry, and He will give you whatever grace you need to be able to serve in that. And in those days when this was written, the ministers were subject to poverty, need, and per- persecution. So this task was not for the faint in heart. So it is an honorable task. Secondly, it is a solemn task. As you heard from Pastor Joel, God has given you responsibility to care for for sheep uh, whom Christ has purchased with with his own precious blood. You are a steward uh, who, who will one day give an account for how you have cared for those souls whom the Lord committed to your charge, uh, as we heard earlier. What are some of those duties that God has called you to be uh, a shepherd? Uh, to do? Well, one is you are to shepherd the flock with a Christ-like gentleness and humility. Peter exhorts, as we heard earlier, exhorts the shepherd, he said, 1 Peter 5, So I exhort elders among you, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, 
not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. We're to exercise oversight not in a domineering fashion, lording it over them, but with gentleness as God would have us. In other words, we are to be shepherds after God's own heart, to model the chief shepherd in the way he deals with us, and he deals with his sheep, and he dealt with his disciples. Your life is to be worthy of imitation. They are to see Christ in you. Secondly, as a shepherd, you are to shepherd with a goal of helping the sheep become more like Christ. This, is what, this was Paul's goal in ministry. He, this is what he says, Colossians 1.28. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Galatians 4.19, he says, My little children for whom I am again in anguish of, in childbirth, until Christ is formed in you. We are to preach and teach with the purpose of seeing Christ formed in them, his humility, his love, his patience, and his gentleness. But also we are to help them become mature in understanding. So they're not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. As we read in Ephesians 4, 12 through 14, where Christ gave uh, elders and pastors and teachers and apostles to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro with every, uh, by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful themes. We heard earlier, there are all kinds of voices out there that are seeking to get the flock, get to the ears of the flock. Our job as brother is to equip them so they could be discerning, so they could hear the right shepherd from the wrong shepherd, the good shepherd from the bad shepherd. And so they can uh, not just be tossed in every direction like little children. Thirdly, as a shepherd, you are to protect them from those false teachers. In his farewell address to the Ephesian elders, Paul calls them to be alert for false teachers, which he calls wolves. He says, Pray, uh, pay careful attention to, them, uh, to, themse to yourself and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he has obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, there fierce wolves will come in, uh, in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own cells will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. So therefore, be alert. So he says there's going to be from outside, there's going to be these wolves that are coming into and infiltrating into the flock but not only from outside, but also from inside, from among you, those who will be speaking, uh, uh, speaking twisted things in order to draw men after them. So our job, brother, is to, uh, is to uh, fend the, sh the flock against those heretics, against those with false teachings, whether from within or from without. We're not hirelings who see the enemy coming and run the other way. We're going to put our necks on the line in order to protect the flock. Fourthly, as a shepherd, you are to train other leaders. Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.2, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Or to look out uh, to amongst us for faithful men in the congregation who have the gift of teaching and seek to train them to be church leaders and church planters. Fifthly and finally, under the task, what the tasks of a shepherd are, is to give spiritual oversight and establish God-honoring worship. I'm running through these quick. I'll forward you my notes. You can study them if you want. But I, I, I realize our time is pressed, so I'm, I'm, I'm more so reading than preaching. Give spiritual oversight and establish God-honoring worship. 
One of the titles, as Pastor Joe pointed out, given to a pastor uh, is a bishop. A bishop is ep episkopos in the Greek, which means to oversee, one who oversees and governs the congregation in accordance with the Word of God. As, it's, uh, as it says in the qualifications, 1 Timothy 3, how can he manage or oversee the congregation or the house of God if he can't manage his own household well? So as apostolic rep uh, representatives, both Timothy and Titus were instructed to establish biblical order in the worship and gathering of the church. They were to appoint elders and deacons, establish prayer meetings, to read, preach, and teach the Word of God in public meetings. The public worship of God is not to be governed by men's opinions, but by the Word of God. That requires pastors to ensure that it happens. Our worship is to reflect God's character. He is the God of order and of holiness. Our worship is to be orderly with reverence and joy. So the task God's calling you to, brother, is a noble task. It's a solemn task. Thirdly, it's a rewarding task. The office of a pastor has rewards both for now and for eternity. For now, as Pastor Joe mentioned, there is no greater joy than to see people walking in truth. As, as John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. Paul was overjoyed to hear of the Thessalonians' walk, work of faith, labor of love, and steadfast hope in Christ. He says, for what is our hope and joy or crown of boasting before, your, uh, before our Lord Jesus Christ? It is, it, it is you, for you are our glory and joy. So there's that joy that you receive from seeing people walking in truth and loving the Lord Jesus Christ and serving one another. But there's also eternal joys in the life to come. Peter, as we heard earlier, Peter telling the exhorting the shepherds, he says in 1 Peter 5, 4, but when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So there is a reward that is yet to come. Hearing the hearing. Christ say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Uh, there are no greater words that we can hear than these. No greater blessing. It will be worth all the toil and difficulty of this task. Finally, a word again to the congregation, brethren. Uh, how essential it is to pray. How essential it is to pray. As you could see, this is no small task. It requires spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical toughness. Uh, he will need our prayers in all those areas. There is going to be a lot of spiritual warfare associated with this task because, as Pastor Joe reminded us, Satan doesn't want to see the work of God go forward. Satan would love to bring the shepherd down and scatter the sheep. So basically... Go through the qualifications, 1 Timothy 3, and pray for uh, growth in each of those areas, that he would grow in godliness, that he would manage his household well and be able to balance his other responsibilities. Pray for his wife and children that God would protect them as he gives himself over to the ministry and pray for protection from the evil one. That's all I have to say. So, if, brethren... Brother Ibrahim and the Pastor Damien, Pastor Joe, if you could come forward. Just one question, Brother Ibrahim, I have for you, and then we will be praying. Are you committed by the grace of God to serve this congregation as a faithful steward and who has been entrusted by the Lord Jesus Christ to shepherd his sheep, not under compulsion, but willingly, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, and not domineering over them, but with a Christ-like humility? Amen. 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 Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we do thank you for giving good gifts to your people. We are undeserving. You are worthy. 
and the fact that you shed your love upon us and provide for us, oh Lord, we will glorify you forever. Brahim is one such gift. And yet we know the temptation to boast in our gift and not in you. And though we all attest to his humility, we still pray that you would keep him humble. That, Lord, you would help his pride to be in check. That he would fight by the Spirit of God and the Word of God against any bitterness, any laziness, any apathy towards your people, towards your work, toward you. Lord, every day set his heart afresh and ablaze with love for you. May his love for the people that he serves flow from his love for you, which flows from your love for him. And so we pray that you would help him to fight the spiritual battles against temptation. As he's been doing his whole Christian life and his ministerial life, may it continue. May he grow into the image of Christ. We commit him into your hands. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, even as we have just heard of the high calling and the great responsibility of of being an under-shepherd, Lord, we recognize that our brother will not be able to do this without the help of your spirit. So we ask you, Lord, to, to, to come alongside him in this endeavor and help him every way along the way. Help him in the hard work that no one sees in the study. Help him, Lord, as he has opportunities to counsel or minister to others. Help him, Lord, to be that approved workman that we read of. Uh, we also pray, Lord, that at times of weakness that he would always call upon your grace and that he would find strength and help in time of need. We lift up and ask you, Lord, for that, uh, the grace that's needed for the Christ-like gentleness and humility, uh, that he would serve willingly, even eagerly, that he would be alert to false teachers and wolves in the church. Lord, that you would grant him the spiritual gifts in association with, with his calling, uh, that uh, he would uh, look out for faithful men in the church to, to train them up. And Father, we also pray for the responsibility that the church has as a whole, uh, our, the church's duty toward him to honor him, to gain confidence and trust in his ministry, to submit to him, whether it be his counsel and his teaching, and also to regularly pray for him. Lord, as this is our this is our sustenance and our life force. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And Father, as we think of his other responsibilities at home, as a father, as a husband, uh, as, a, as a man who has his uh, business, running his own business, Father, in each of those areas, uh, please help him to find the balance. Uh, Father, that by your grace that he would not do one at the expense of the other, but he would, Lord, manage well his household, manage well his business, that in every area he would have a great testimony, that others could testify that this man is a man of God who has been chosen by the Lord to lead in all of those areas, and that, Lord, his walk is worthy of imitation. So please bless and Help him in all of those, balancing those responsibilities. Lord, bless his family, Father. I pray for each of the children, Lord, for Timothy, Benjamin, and for Nathaniel. Lord, that these young men would grow up to see, uh, as they look to their dad and the godly model that he is, Lord, that they too would, would trust in Christ and be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord. Be the next generation of leaders. Be with Vicky, Lord, as she seeks to be supportive of her husband. Lord, as she, as she sees him in difficult times, that she would be able to come alongside, Lord, and help encourage him when he feels discouraged. Lord, uh, be, be in every uh, aspect of these uh, uh, opportunities and ministries, O oh, Father, that he would hear your voice, well done, good and faithful servant. We commit this to you and thank you and pray for protection over him and his family, Lord, from the evil one. Father, we know that, uh, that Satan does not want to, to see our brother uh, prosper, does not want him to see him going forward and ministering, and uh, we pray for protection over his family and himself. We pray this in the name 
that is above every name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Did you want to say something? Oh, if you know how uncomfortable I am here. <laughs> um, in the Old Testament, um, there is moments in the life of the old people where they would warrant a memorial. And when Pastor Joe asked me that I would say something after the ordination, I thought, I think this may be a, a good moment to just give praise to the Lord for a few things. And so I, I'm going to ju just give praise for four groups of people quickly. Um, one, I want to praise God for my parents. Uh, oh man, I'm emotional. <laughs> um, I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, I should have kept them to the end. <laughs> um, in 2 Timothy 3.15, it says, Paul says to Timothy, you've been acquainted since childhood with sacred scriptures. And uh, I, was I and my siblings were definitely acquainted with um, sacred writings since we were children. We opened our eyes uh, to parents whose uh, Christ and his church where uh, the center of their life, uh, my mom was always involved in women's ministries, and my dad was a bivocational elder. And I grew up seeing him being faithful, working for the church, and that's what inspired me to bo want to be in the ministry, is his example. So parents, Set a good example for your kids. Uh, second, I want to give praise for Vicky. Um, when I got engaged to Vicky overseas, and then she came here to get married here, thinking that she's marrying a podiatrist. <laughs> only to realize, only to realize that I was more involved in church than I was in my practice, which is why it wasn't doing so well. <laughs> and um, she has a funny story she can tell you about that one day um, and then a few years later I was uh, pushed into uh, the responsibility of preaching and pastoring our church in Patterson because our uh, existing pastor at that time left and I was pushed to it and for 10 years um, I was doing that um, so we never truly had uh, a true relaxing weekend. Um, uh, Saturdays were always about preparing the sermon for Sunday, and Sunday was a full day of church and activity. Uh, and yet she never complained. Um, she <laughs> I'm never like this. <laughs> uh, uh, um, I, uh, she always allows me time and space, and takes care of the kids, and um, she was more excited about me being ordained today than even I was. <laughs> so uh, being married to Vicky Harrow is the greatest blessing of my life short of the cross. Um, third, I want to praise God for the elders of this church. Uh, for the past year, I had the honor and the privilege of seeing them operate up close in a way that you probably don't see. And every time we meet together, I leave uh, praising God for these three men. Um, they serve the Lord uh, with a pure purpose of glorifying God. There is no personal motive whatsoever. They serve the Lord with humility and they serve the Lord with pure and sincere love to you, the flock of this church. Um, I know how much effort and prayers they put for, for all of us to care for us. I mean, t this morning's sermon is, is exhibit number one for that. Um, so I praise God and I look forward to serving along with them and learning, continue to learn from them. 
And lastly, I want to praise God for you, uh, the members of Bread of Life. When, I, when we first came here two and a half years ago, I knew what kind of church I was getting into. Uh, I knew the doctrine, I knew the, the constitution, and I knew that this was, as far as I know, this is the kind of church I want to be with because I believe that's the biblical model for a church. What I wasn't prepared for was, was the people of the church. You stole our hearts and made the decision so easy to join in. Uh, I remember early on in, in, in our coming here, I told Vicky, I said, man, these people, not only do they tolerate one hour of preaching, they actually look forward to it. <laughs> they, they, they want to listen, to sit through a two-hour service and one hour of preaching. I've never seen anything like this. Um, you come on Sunday morning 15 minutes early, half the people are already here. Uh, you, the service, a two-hour service is over, and nobody's in a hurry to leave because they enjoy the presence of the Lord. Everybody knows everybody's name. Everybody's in each other's lives, praying for each other, uh, lingering around and we have sensed the, your love for us uh, in ways that we cannot uh, speak of so I praise God for you brothers and sisters and I look forward to serving with you and to serving you in the days and the years to come may our God be honored always and glorified Just as, so the servers, let me just say before the servers go, hold on, Catherine, I just want to say something. I, I just want to give a shout out to our hospitality team and uh, praise God for all of you, those who uh, planned, uh, purchased supplies, uh, worked on the meals, did set up, going to do cleanup later. Just praise God for all of you because this is the body of Christ. This is what we're doing serving us we give thanks to the lord for you for using your gifts to serve us praise the lord you may go okay 10 minutes before they go down oh yes let's give thanks for the food thank you thank you bob heavenly father oh lord thank you for nourishing our souls with rich food just uh, today lord for blessing us with your word and feeding us by your spirit thank you through your servant lord you have been so good to us, Father, and you have blessed us with uh, physical food that we're about to enjoy, this, the nourishment for our bodies. Thank you for the many, many, many hands that have labored to prepare and, and make this available to us. Lord, may you be in our midst during our fellowship. May you get glory, Lord, as you see the brethren dwelling together in unity. There is great joy. There's a great blessing. We give you all the thanks and praise for all your mercies and gifts to us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.